going to be talking about the skin signs of tuberous sclerosis, which I know that you will all know well. Um, but most of the time we're going to talk about topical rapamycin and the, the sort of practical aspects of treating the skin manifestations. So remember the, the skin signs of TS are a very big and important part of the clinical diagnosis. So four of the 11 major diagnostic criteria relate to the skin and three of the six minor criteria relate to the skin. So we'll go through these one by one and think about treatment and also looking at um, age appropriate treatment because it really does change as children get older and become adults. So firstly, facial angiofibromas. So most angiofibromas start between three and six years of age, but you often can see the tiny red dots as young as 18 months or two. They're made up of blood vessels and collagen, and that becomes important as we look at response to treatments like topical rapamycin. They continue to increase throughout teenage years, but by somewhere between 16 and 18 years, they stabilise. And so what you've got by about 18 is what you'll take into adult life. You don't get a lot of new ones, but the pre-existing ones may kind of chunk up a little bit as you get older. Remember that one or two angiofibromas are quite common in the population, so it's the number that's important in the setting of TS. So now thinking about topical rapamycin, and we use rapamycin and sirolimus obviously interchangeably. The thing about topical rapamycin, it works better on blood vessels than it does on collagen. So the sooner you start, the better response you see. It works much better on the little red dots than on the big lumpy lesions. We initially started using it twice a day. But now I mostly just use it at night, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is kids don't really like doing a lot in the morning. Uh, it's hard enough getting breakfast into them and getting them dressed without having to put creams on. That's a general rule that goes across dermatology, whether you've got eczema or angiofibromas. Also, when we were using crushed tablets, and if you are using crushed tablets, they don't want to go to school with bits of cr tablet crushed on their face, and they don't actually even want a greasy face when they go to school. So it's much easier if you just do it at night. And if you can get, get in early, and this obviously is relevant only for people with very young children, once you've got them under good control, you can actually drop back to two to three times per week. But if you stop, they'll come back. Now, what I don't know is, if I treat a child from, say, from three years of age with topical rapamycin through to 18, perhaps I will be able to stop. Actually, leave them low, leave them low. I think the film crew need them up. Oh, really? Because, no, the oh, pictures are not up? as good. The pictures are not as good. Because in a minute we're looking at befores and afters, even if we just do the befores and afters. Um, you, yes. Um, so yes, that may be possible if we go right through to 18, we may eventually be able to stop it, but we don't know the answer to that just yet. So these are some of our lovely West Australian children who've consented to have their pictures. So this, was Ava, this is Ava, who was one of our first children. We initially started treating Ava with topical rapamune, the liquid, but that was very irritating. She had to use a topical cortisone every day, so rapidly she was changed to the tablets, and this was after four weeks of the tablets. And you can see that she's got, on the before picture on the left, lots of little red dots, and she's got a fibrous cephalic plaque just uh, lateral to her, so this has got a little pointer on it, just in, in here. And the little red dots have done better than the fibrous cephalic plaque. That's a rule across the, across the board. They are definitely harder to treat. So Ava was six when we started treatment. Now we'll look at some other children as they are getting older. So Thomas was seven. You can see after four weeks of crushed tablets, a really, really good outcome. Um, almost complete clearance. Jacob was 11. So Jacob's starting to get some, some lumpier lesions. This I'd really call a, a fibrous cephalic plaque. It's bigger than an angiofibroma. Um, and you can see that he's improved, but it's not as good as the, the younger children. Ethan was 12, and Ethan's spots, he, they're very red, but they're not very raised. So you know that he's going to do very well with it. 
One of the other problems we had actually with our studies, it's so difficult with photography getting good befores and afters. So I look at this and it looks like I'm trying to fake the after because it's a bit <laughs> overexposed. But honestly, it's so difficult to do that well. And Jaden was our oldest. Jaden is 17 and uh, he's got a lot of very lumpy angiofibromas. So he's improved, he's delighted with his outcome. But ideally what I would like to do with Jaden when he is ready is under a quick general anaesthetic, shave some of the thicker ones and then we can maintain the, just the red ones with, with the um, cream. Now once you get to this point, it's, it's really probably a waste of time just using topical rapamycin. They have to be physically removed, whether that's, well, they don't have to be, it's only obviously if they're causing a problem, but these are causing a problem. It's not the look of them, it's the fact that they bleed all the time and he picks them and fiddles with them, so the bleeding is distressing. So in this situation, the, really the nose has to be recontoured and that can be done either with CO2 laser or with shave excisions, obviously under general anaesthesia. And the interesting thing is an adult like this, if you recontour the nose, it heals with a little bit of scar tissue, but often then the angiofibromas don't recur. So they often need a, a physical procedure more than topical rapamycin. So now just the, the sort of practicalities of topical rapamycin. And if we start with the crush tablets, because for most people, that is now the most practical and accessible option. Now that sirolimus has been listed under the PBS, any compounding pharmacist should be able to make this up for a reasonable cost. Now they do vary a lot in how much they charge for mixing things. That goes across the board in dermatology because we get a lot of things mixed. Um, now our pharmacists feel that 0.1% is the strongest that you can make by crushing tablets and they prefer to put it into a greasy base, like a petrolatum type base. I see these reports coming from overseas about 0.2% in a gel, but that is quite difficult actually to make. And it takes a lot of effort from the pharmacist because if they don't crush the tablets well, then you've got really big chunks of tablet. And I don't think that works as well. And we actually had one of our children, a little sharp fragment of tablet, cut one of his angiofibromas and made it bleed a bit. So the pharmacists really have to work hard at it. And I have to say that they don't like doing it particularly. They're worried about inhaling aerosolized immunosuppressant is how they see it, even though I'm absolutely positive that the amount they inhale would be completely trivial. So some of them insist that they'll only do it if they've got a very good extraction hood. Now you'll, you'll see reports of topical everolimus, I don't think it matters. I think they're, it's just a, a topical mTOR inhibitor, it really doesn't matter which it is. And at the moment certainly sirolimus is much more affordable and accessible um, whereas Everolimus has, has got its PBS limitations. Now the powder definitely makes a nicer preparation, but, um, and I know some people have been paying a lot for pharmacists to buy the powder. Our hospital, we now use the powder and I think public hospitals probably should be using the powder. They can afford to buy in bulk, whereas individual pharmacists will never have enough patients to be able to justify buying in bulk. But it makes a much creamier, nicer preparation to use. But we were interested that 0.1% crushed tablet definitely was superior in its effectiveness to 0.1% powder. But the thing about the powder is you can make different concentrations. So we can make up to a 1% with the powder and we know that 0.5 and 1% powder is definitely better than 0.1% crushed tablet. But in saying that, if all you've got are the tablets, really the 0.1%, all of those pictures I showed you are with the crushed tablets. So patients like the powder much more than crushed tablets. Uh, pharmacists prefer using it but of course it's accessing it and it's the cost of it. But certainly for public hospital pharmacies, I think they, they should all be accessing it. 
Now, if ever you're stuck, you can use the liquid for short periods, but you need to use a topical steroid as well, even if you just buy Dermaid 1% over the counter. Um, so if ever you're, you're really stuck because you can get a 60 ml bottle now for $37 or less with a healthcare card. Now, fibrous cephalic plaques, so here's Jaden again, and you can see he's got these big, chunky fibrous cephalic plaques. They are more collagen than blood vessels, so they don't respond as well to topical rapamycin unless you can get in very early before they've become raised. But once they're lumpy like that, really surgical excision is the best if it's causing a, a cosmetic problem. Jaden doesn't care at all, they're normally under his fringe, but some children do care. I had a girl um, just a couple of days ago who's developed a big lumpy cephalic plaque on her scalp that she picks all the time and it bleeds, so she's going to have that excised under a quick general anaesthetic. And then that's a good opportunity to shave any of the lumpy ones, tidy things up, and then she will go back just to topical rapamycin. Now, hypomelanotic macules, of course, these are the first cutaneous manifestation of TS presenting at birth or in early infancy. They may be a patch of white hair, which we call polyosis. And the confetti-like skin lesions, which are one of the minor diagnostic criteria, are really histologically the same as hypomelanotic macules. Now, these are mostly not a cosmetic problem. They're typically on the torso or the limbs, but actually they do respond to topical rapamycin and they do improve even with oral mTOR inhibitors. So uh, if ever, for example, some... Sorry? Most of us haven't heard that before. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm noticing... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. They're, they are there because of the mutation and they respond as well as well. So for some, say for some women who've got lots of the confetti-like ones on their chest, right, well, you, if, that, if that bothered her as a teenager, we can apply the ointment across the chest. So yeah, it is worth realising. It's interesting, all of the cutaneous manifestations are uh, responsive to mTOR inhibitors. So uh, it's just, yeah, yeah. Now, the chagrin patch, um, people whose children are on an oral or on Everolimus will notice that it will delay the progression of the chagrin patch. The nuisance with chagrin patches, I mean, they're mostly not a cosmetic issue, but you can see from this picture, they often get these big blackheads and they're very prone to boils. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I'm sure some, many of you experience this. That's why they become so painful because it's right where you lean back in a chair or you sit on them. And uh, so often we end up getting them excised because of this recurrent boil formation. And surgery is the best option. Topical rapamycin would have no hope with a chagrin patch. But certainly oral everolimus will help uh, retard at least the progression. Ungual fibromas, now the same. If you can get ungual fibromas early, then topical rapamycin will delay them. You'll notice that um, everolimus, they often regress. Um, now, the problem with the ungual fibromas, you can see in this picture, because it's pressing on where the nail grows from, it causes this groove in the nail, and then you get this little nick at the end, which is a, just a real nuisance. And they catch, yeah, <laughs> they catch. So, yes, if, if you get in early, they're definitely responsive to a topical treatment. Um, surgically removing them is a bit harder, well, it's not hard, but you are at risk of causing damage to the nail matrix and then having a sort of a, a permanent um, ridge in the nail, which then can defeat the purpose because it's often the little nick at the end that's been so annoying. So in terms of adverse effects, apart from that one that was cut with the fragment of tablet, we've had very few adverse effects. We've stopped doing blood tests because we, we just, we could register it in the blood of a couple of patients, but nowhere near immunosuppressive levels. Um, I was worried that the greasy base would cause acne in teenagers. And we have had a couple of acnes, but we manage them as we would normally manage acne, and it really hasn't been a big problem. 
Now, good sun protection is important. It's important in all our children growing up in Australia. It's important particularly because of this suggestion that UV may aggravate or increase the development of angiofibromas. And also because Sirolimus rapamycin is an immunosuppressive, we have this issue of, well, if we use it long term, will we increase the risk of skin cancers? Now, I'm actually not particularly concerned about this because we know from the renal literature that uh, Sirolimus, in contrast to the other immunosuppressants they use, doesn't have anywhere near the ability for producing skin cancers as, say, azathioprine. And in fact, if their transplant patients are developing skin cancers, they change them to Sirolimus because it's actually used to treat squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. So although we have to put it as a, as a hypothetical possible problem, I'm actually not overly worried by it. But I still would say good sun protection because that's what I say for all children growing up in Australia. And with that, I'll finish because I'm sure there's questions. And once again, I just really need to thank my patients from Western Australia who have been such an incredible help and so accepting of me being a bit experimental. <laughs>